Hello, everyone, and welcome back to More Than a Muse. I'm Stani. And I'm Sadie. And today we have a very special Thanksgiving themed episode slash artist for you. We've been doing this podcast now for this is our what third November? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Which is crazy. And every holiday, every major event, we like finding themed people, of course, you know, want it to be relevant. Uh, I have no idea how this person, I don't know. I, I'm just like shocked that it's now that I'm <laughs> discovering her because this woman is the reason why we have Thanksgiving. And that was just mind blowing for me to learn I'm and to realize. So shocked that you found her. Like, Thanksgiving yeah. and Christmas are always the hardest, yes. uh, especially like Christmas. You'd be shocked mm -hmm. how little women are involved in Christmas, which not in reality, but like in the lore and history of it yeah. and everything. And yeah, like I'm surprised we didn't come across her sooner with how much we've been searching, but I'm glad you found her at all. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. And I wanted to shout out how I found her. So I... I was struggling to find an artist to cover this month. I had picked somebody else and then I realized her name was also Maria and you had covered a Maria. And I was like, you know, that might get confusing. I think I can save her for a future month. So anyways, I just Googled Thanksgiving woman artist and I found this blog from 2012. Reveries under the sign of Austin, I think is the name of the blog. And it's titled Thanksgiving, invented by women, a foremother artist, Laura Knight. Now, the artist I'm covering is not named Laura Knight. The title was very confusing to me, but the first half of the article was about the person who invented Thanksgiving. And then the second part was this woman artist that she wanted to talk about, which actually now Laura Knight is on my to cover list next year. So there we you'll go. be hearing about her. But anyways, I just thought it was so funny of all the times I've like searched for woman Thanksgiving I woman know. artist. <laughs> And it was from this article that randomly was the top of the search engine because it had the words Thanksgiving woman artist right in a row together, even though they weren't actually that connected. So Gotta love Google. Sometimes I know. It was just so funny. I am haunted by the process of what a podcast would be without Google. Truly. So shout out to the author <laughs> of the blog post, Ellen Moody. You really are the reason why we are here today. Apparently, she a, has a PhD in British literature. Now I know who, I don't want to say invented Thanksgiving, but in a way invented Thanksgiving. Yeah. But she is also an artist. She's a writer. I genuinely am so excited to talk about her because there's like two things that are incredibly foundational almost to like American culture that they both came from this woman. So That's so cool. I don't necessarily want to give it away, but yeah. anything we need to discuss before I jump into this episode. Are you doing anything so. for I don't know, any special holiday traditions? No, I'm going to eat Thanksgiving food with my family. That's, that sounds so good, That's the though. tradition. That's what, I mean, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What, more, what more do you want? I'm trying to think if there's like anything in pop culture that... I mean, Travis Kelsey is, and Taylor Swift still going strong. I mean, <laughs> I always want to talk about Taylor Swift and I know. Travis Kelsey, you know. The Argentina show. Come on, Listen, <laughs> I was off my phone. I was actually at a hockey game, mm -hmm. um, went to an NHL game for the first time ever. It was it was a lot of fun, Love but that. I left the game and checked my phone and had like four text messages from one of my good friends just like, oh my gosh, the kiss <laughs> and the chiefs. And I had no idea what she was talking about, but I trusted that she had good reason to be freaking out the yeah. way she was. I mean, like, she did. Yeah. And then I saw the videos and I was like, oh, I get it. <laughs> correct. Yep. This is the correct response. <laughs> it's a very cute. I'm very happy about them. I want them to get married and grow old <laughs> together and be cute and adorable forever. I just I love it so much. I can't I can't help but love it too. I know. It's so great. Yeah, no, I mean, that's like, it. Hmm, anything in pop culture. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, are we talking about Taylor Swift again? How did that happen on this podcast? Yeah. The Grammy nominations are also announced. True. So Grammy nominations cool. came out. If yeah. you care about the Grammys, we have two episodes, I think, mm -hmm. that have kind of covered the Grammys in the past. If you were curious to how they decide those, you can check yeah, it out. Also, I mean, shout out to the fact that 
seven out of the eight album of the year nominees were women this year finally so that was pretty cool (laughs) yeah we talked about gender disparity in like all of the awards but the grammys have been really really bad at that so it's a good thing they're catching up i know it was really really cool to see that Mm -hmm. all right well we can move on and talk about Sarah Josepha Hale. This woman has a special place in my heart now. I'm I'm worried that the episode is going to be a little bit shorter than our other ones. That's okay. Last week's was particularly long, um, which you know, (laughs) so true. (laughs) But I felt like as I was doing the research with this woman, it was like, okay, either I'm doing the brief overview or we're doing like a full dissertation. Like it didn't really seem like there was a great in between. And also, I mean, she. She existed a long time ago. Her dad was a Revolutionary War veteran. So she's very, very beginning in here in America. But yeah, her name is Sarah Josepha Hale. And to start out with a quote from her, quote, Thanksgiving is a festive which will never become obsolete for it cherishes the best affections of the heart, the social and domestic ties. And I just thought that was a wholesome little quote about Thanksgiving. And I'll obviously talk about how she did that. But for a very brief overview, she was born October 24th of 1788. She was an American writer, an activist, and an editor for one of the most widely circulated magazines in the period in between, I guess, like after the Revolutionary War, of course, up until the Civil War called Godey's Ladies Book. And also very famously is she was the author of the nursery rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb, which I mean. Love. Yeah. <laughs> like that is almost like such an iconic thing that in my mind, it's like the ABCs. Like who wrote the ABC song? Actually, that's something I'm going to Google afterwards to see if people know the answer. But my point being, of like, it's almost like so in culture that it's, oh, yeah, someone had to like invent that and write that. Is that is such a good point. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like Rosy Posy or Ring Around the yeah. Rosy. Or- Ring Around the Rosy. It's like, where did that come from? Mm-hmm. It just feels like it's always been here. and It has forever. It- <laughs> no, but it was a woman. And <laughs> yeah. Sarah Joseph Hale wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb in a children's poetry book. And then she famously campaigned for the creation of the American holiday known as Thanksgiving. So two pretty Wonderful. major things, I think, in American culture. And it's definitely it's all because of Sarah Joseph Hale. No, why? Maybe it's because a lot of nursery rhymes are like English. But I think yeah. I thought Mary Had a Little Lamb was like a little British poem. That's yeah, that's very true actually. Just so it makes me it came from over there. Yeah, it makes me happy. We've got a little bit of yeah. American legacy going on there with our nursery rhymes. Totally. That's cool. Well, she was born in Newport, New Hampshire, to Captain Gordon Buell, who, as I mentioned, was a Revolutionary War veteran. Her mother's name was Martha Whittlesey Buell. What was really cool is that her parents believed in equal education for both their son and their daughter. Uh, She was homeschooled by her mother and her older brother, but her elder brother attended Dartmouth. So she was definitely getting a good good education, but she was also just like a really big learner Hmm. on her own. She grew up and became just a local school teacher. And then in 1811, her father opened a tavern called the Rising Sun in Newport. And that same year that her father opened the tavern, she met a lawyer named David Hale, and they got married actually at that tavern that her father owned on October 23rd of 1813. Is that on her birthday? Her birthday is October 24th. So she got married the day before her birthday that year. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even realize that. That is cute. They together had five children. The first was named David that was born in 1815, Horatio in 1817, Francis in 1819, and then Sarah in 1820, and then William in 1822. So five children all pretty much one after the other. Very tragically though, David Hale died in 1822. So the year that her youngest was born, And she actually wore black for the rest of her life as a sign of perpetual mourning. Wow. I know. That is so sad. sad. So here she is, 1822. Her first was born in 1815, which means she has five kids all under the age of seven. And her husband passes away. Brave woman. I know. So because of this, she obviously is in need of financial help. Her husband has passed away. She actually got some financial support from her late husband's Freemason Lodge. 
And they funded to publish a collection of her, her poems called The Genius of Oblivion. And then four years later in 1827, her first novel was actually published in the U.S. under the title Northwood, Life, North and South. And then in London, it was published under a title, A New England Tale. And it made her one of the very first novelists to actually write a book with slavery in it, as well as one of the first American woman novelists, period, which is really, you know, cool. Yeah. I think we talked about this in the episode that we did about, was it Elizabeth Keckley, who was the dress designer for yes, the Lincoln? for Mary Todd Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Yes. So we talked a little bit about how, like, Abraham Lincoln was – you know, like his idea basically was that we should just like relocate the slaves from America or like he prescribed to that idea. And that's kind of what she talked about in her novel. So she supported relocating the nation's African slaves to freedom in Liberia. So on one hand, that's so awesome that she said no more slavery. But like yeah. also we can look at that and realize that, <laughs> see yeah. that there's still problems with that. But at least, you know, she was like, hey, slavery is bad. I don't think these people should be enslaved. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the same time, it's like, oh, but well, why couldn't they just kick them out exist. of the country <laughs> yeah, yeah with you in the mm -hmm. same country? And this book was kind of intended to be like the New England virtues, like just kind of show like this is what America is about. In the second edition she wrote in the introduction, she said the great error of those who would sever the union rather than see a slave within its borders is that they forget the master is their brother as well as the servant and that the spirit which seeks to do good to all and evil to none is the only true Christian philanthropy. Mm. So, you know, though on one hand, like she was – pointing out the hypocrisy and calling out people who would rather like go to war as yeah. a country rather than say, okay, I won't have slaves. You know, like, so she's calling this out, which I thought was really cool. And the book described how while slavery hurts and dehumanizes slaves, absolutely, it also dehumanizes the masters and slows the world's psychological, moral, and tech progress. She basically was arguing in the book that slavery ruins your society altogether, which- I mean, I would agree. Nobody yeah, should I would be able agree. to own I, another person. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that was like really interesting and cool to read that like you know yeah. she was writing a novel about that that's um, very forward thinking of her i know reverend john blake praised northwood and asked hale to move to boston to serve as the editor of his journal which was the ladies magazine and she agreed and so from 1828 until 1836 she served as editor in boston she apparently preferred the title editress which is <laughs> Cute. The assignment drew praise from the critic and feminist writer John Neal, who proclaimed in The Yankee, quote, we hope to see the day when she editors will be as common as he editors and when our women of all ages will be able to maintain herself without being obliged to marry for bread. Fair. Yeah, same. <laughs> um, but And that was Sarah's hope as well, is that she hoped that the magazine would help in educating women. And she wrote that not that they may usurp the situation or enroach on the prerogatives of man, but that each individual may lend her aid to the intellectual and moral character of those held with in her sphere. So for my read on the situation, I think she was still very conservative, very like for traditional gender roles and things, but she very much was just for the education of women, period. Yeah. Um, I'll talk about it probably later too, but like she herself wasn't for women's suffrage, but yet at the same time, she believed that like women should have influence on the way that their husbands voted. You know so what I mean? So she was for women's suffrage. She just was, yeah. It's like people I mean, were like, well, I think yeah. women should have rights, but I'm not a feminist. It's like, hmm. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. It's okay. There's, We've all yeah. been through a period of time where we're like that. Like she was pretty, very forward thinking for, you know, the world yeah. that she was in. But like, she wasn't necessarily like the picture perfect feminist icon is yeah. essentially just what I'm no, pointing out. No, that's fair. I mean, mm -hmm. it's funny to think back at a time when, like, literally just wanting to vote was considered radical. Yeah. Or, uh -huh. like, wearing bloomers under yeah. your dress. You know, I like, know. it's just kind of funny that that was, like, causing a stir and an uproar in society mm -hmm. to the point where people had to be like, well, we don't have to absurd, absurd, 
the men but like yeah Mm -hmm. we should be able to make some money on our own you know yeah and it's like (laughs) i'm sure just like walking that fine balance of like not wanting to overstep themselves yeah and but also being like but like women can learn things too none of us can relate to that at all right (laughs) no that's so true (laughs) (laughs) not wanting to come across as too radical while still standing up for yourself unfortunately that was most of my teenage years into my early 20s it happens now you know it's like oh i don't want to be difficult i don't want to hurt people's feelings i don't Mm want to anyways so i'll talk a little bit more to i think later about her personal health beliefs but it's still really cool you know how much she did advocate very truly and thoroughly for women like being educated fully yeah her collection poems for our children which includes mary had a little lamb that was originally titled mary's lamb was published in 1830 the poem was written for children an audience for which many women poets of this period were writing which is actually something that maybe could be a cool future episode yeah definitely children's poetry and maybe really diving into who actually wrote all of the children nursery rhymes and see maybe the women that are behind that i think i love that that is a a whole you know like you wrote it down (laughs) okay amazing we'll fit it into next year so in 1837 she began working as editor for the expanded godey's ladies book um and she insisted that she edit from boston while her youngest son william attended harvard college her children are also very well educated and she remained editor at Godey's for 40 years and retired in 1877 when she was almost 90 years old. 40 years? Yeah, she was there for a long, long time. That is a long career. Very long career. And to be in that same position. But during her time there, there were a lot of really important women who contributed poetry and prose to the magazine. For example, uh, Lydia Sigourney, Caroline Lee Hentz, Elizabeth F. Ellett, Eliza Cook, Francis Sargent Osgood, and then other, of course, men as well, Nathaniel mm. Hawthorne, Oliver Wendell mm. Holmes, Washington Irving, Nathaniel Parker Willis, and Edgar Allan Poe. So pretty there notable names in there. And then during this time, she actually became one of the most important tastemakers of what America taste was. And I think especially in the foundations of our country being formed, you know, that's like very significant when you're like, okay, yeah. cool, we're a country. What's our culture now to get? And that was something really important to her of like championing other American writers. That was something that she was aiming for was like she wanted our country to be very united. I mean, obviously, like she called that out, you know, against, mm-hmm. um, like I mentioned, with talking about slavery early. And that was a very... A very, um, what's the word? Like, she was very pointed in that goal. Is yeah. what I'm saying. And the part of the reason why, too, why it was so effective is because the ladies' magazine didn't really have significant competitors. And so, like, when people were reading magazines for ladies, that was the one that they would reach out to. And so it had an influence, quote, unimaginable for any single publication in the 21st century. Its readership was the largest of its day, boasting over 150,000 subscribers for both the North and the South. Both Man. Godies and Sarah herself were considered the largest influences on American life of the day. Which that is, is insane. Crazy. Yeah. Man, if, if you know, 150,000 of you want to subscribe to us, that'd be fine. Yeah, that'd be so fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so true. That is a lot for that amount of time. Like, how many people were even living here? You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. obviously a lot, but like that... That's no, yeah, number. exactly. It is a huge number. I there's also a time when like she really wanted it to be mostly American people that were writing and so sometimes like the magazine would be like 80% of her own writing just because she was like, "See, it's all American writers." But like oh. in reality, she was a big bulk of the <laughs> yeah. But I think in the early days of the magazine, like it was just like such a goal for her to like be championing, you know, like I said, like mm-hmm. creating American culture that she just was yeah. like, ha And now, yeah, how many writers are in this publication? None of your business. They're all American. <laughs> Even if there's Love like it. three of them, you know. Yeah. But the magazine is credited with an ability to influence fashions, not just for women's clothing, but also in domestic architecture. Godies, they actually published house plans that were copied by home builders nationwide. Wow. So like just very foundational things um that's kind of crazy to think about and then during this time she wrote just many novels and poems and published nearly 50 volumes by the end of her life so very prolific in her writing 
Now, as far as why, do you have any idea maybe why Mary Had a Little Lamb is such a famous little poem? There's like, I feel like a reason why. Didn't know if you would know any of the stories. Or I don't like think the- I know the okay, story. I remember being like really uh, like entertained by the, by the idea of a girl taking her lamb to school when I was younger. Yeah. That's so fair. But but that's Well, (laughs) I think the reason why that poem of all poems got cemented in, you know, historical prominence is so she actually retired in 1877 at the age of 89. So she was Mm -hmm. almost nine years old. And that very same year, Thomas Edison spoke the opening lines of Mary's Lamb as the first speech ever recorded on his newly invented phonograph. What? Yeah. Why did he pick Mary at a little lamb? I don't know, but I'm sure that that's why. Like Mary had a little lamb whose fleet was white as snow, and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb yeah, was sure, to, sure go. to go. The Follow poem's longer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But like those are the two lines that people really know, and that's and he I think it's it into the film because Thomas Edison said it. And Kate, that was the first thing ever recorded. Do you remember? I think you were in Utah at this time period. It might have been across mm-hmm. the entire country. I'm not sure. There was this okay. like survey where they did this thing. They called a bunch of people and they asked them what the first word on the moon was. And everyone oh. was like, oh, one small step, you know, like trying to figure yeah. it out and everything. And then they put all these billboards up everywhere that said the first word on that was said on the moon is Houston. Oh. And then they did it again. And then more people got it right. And they were like proving that billboards – work you know yeah and i feel like that would have been a really funny one to be like what was the first word said into a telephone because i bet most people would be like hello yeah (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) it was actually mary that is a crazy like study that they yeah i know right but i've like never forgotten it because like marketing right that's yeah half of my brain but like i just think it's funny that like there's moments like that that are so misconstrued in our brains even mm-hmm. though we know it, like we know Houston was the first word on the moon, but like you don't think about it that way. And I yeah. bet that many people don't really think about what the first word was spoken into a phonograph. Yeah. Well, it was Mary yeah. had a little lamb. There you go. Now you mm-hmm. all know. Now you ever we get all know. quizzed. <laughs> so yeah, when I like read that and realized that, I was like, oh my gosh, that's why. That must be the reason why it's so you know yeah. famous now because otherwise who would care I, know. I don't know like there's a whole she has a whole volume multiple mm-hmm. volumes of children's poems and that's probably the reason why it he that chose time, a good one he chose a good one you know mm-hmm. good for him yeah <laughs> well she passed away at her home in philadelphia on april 30th of 1879 just two years after she retired so she really didn't tell the end of her life there is a blue historical marker that exists close to that and she is buried in a simple grave in the Laurel Hill Cemetery in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I want to talk a little bit about like her activism and her beliefs. So in her role as editor from 1852, she created a section headed, quote, employment for women that discussed Mm -hmm. women's attempts to enter the workforce. She also published the works of Catherine Beecher, Emma Willard, and other really early advocates for education of women. She called for play and physical education as important learning experiences for children. And in 1829, she wrote, quote, physical health and its attendant cheerfulness promote a happy tone of moral feeling, and they are quite indispensable to successful intellectual effort. She just comes across like a very proper woman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is how you raise your children. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know what? Everything I've read so far, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can buy that. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I'm not a mother, but you know, <laughs> physical health is important. Mm-hmm. But she also, in addition to women's employment, she was a very early advocate for higher education of women. And she helped found Vassar College. Vassar College is a private liberal arts college in New York. And it was the second degree granting institution of higher education for women in the United States. Oh, okay. It became co-educational, I guess is the word, in 1969. But yeah, it was the second women, second college in America that was specifically for women. She obviously, you know, was very passionate. She put her money where her mouth was and Mm -hmm. helped open up a college. Her championship championship of women's education began as she edited the ladies' magazines and continued until she retired. What I thought was cool, she wrote no fewer than 17 articles and editorials about women's education and basically kind of helped like making the founding of an all women's college acceptable to public ideas. So it's like because she was a tastemaker 
and writing so much like I think she was she was just trying to normalize it you know mm -hmm. to put it in today's term in 1860 the Baltimore Female College Award awarded Hale a medal for distinguished services in the cause of female education which I think is really cool and then she also worked endlessly to uplift the historical memory of women which is so cool. Mm -hmm. Among her 50 plus books were several editions of women's record, sketches of all distinguished women from the creation to AD 1854. And it had 2,500 entries that made an like an encyclopedia to put women at the center of world history. Where is Which it? Is, I don't know, but I'm like, same. Like, can I have a what? copy? <laughs> I feel very connected to this woman. Yes. That's what I do. <laughs> I'm like educating women, talking about women's influence on history. Yes. Mm -hmm. We can we can totally get behind Making that. Making an encyclopedia, shouting out the women that she felt like was not not getting not the recognized. recognition that they deserved. Like Love this it. sounds familiar. Yes. Anyways. But she was also like a really big like Christian and she interpreted the progress of history as based upon the development of Christianity and mm. emphasized how essential women's morality was to Christianity. She argued that the woman was quote God's appointed agent of morality which I have my thoughts on, but that was her belief yeah. and I think is what drove I mean, a lot of the decisions in her life. less toxic than some stuff I've heard. So. You know what? So true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think there's danger of, you know, making women be the moral police and then yeah. that becomes to it's women's fault no. for men's discretions. Like, I completely agree. No one gender can be right. responsible for the morality of an entire species that's World. not fair yeah yes but you're right you know what we've heard so many more worse <laughs> ideas on this podcast really so have. like hey you know what? like of all the things i mean eh, it's misguided yeah. but <laughs> misguided flawed but you know <laughs> but she is a, of course successful and popular editor she was respected as an arbiter for taste for middle class women and like i mentioned there's fashion cooking literature and morality she very much reinforced stereotypical gender roles with like domestic roles, but like also just casually trying to expand them. For example, she believed that women shaped the morals of society and pushed for women to write morally uplifting novels. And she wrote that while the ocean of political life is heaving and raging with the storm of partisan passions among the men of America, women as the true conservators of peace and goodwill should be careful to cultivate every gentle feeling. It, you know, it's it's very dated. Yeah, we'll give but her like, a break because it's the 1800s. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. It's more progressive than mm -hmm. you know. For 1800s America, I can I can yeah. point to where it was. So, like I mentioned too, she did not support women's suffrage, um, but instead believed in the secret, silent influence of women to sway male voters. Why does that like sound kind of like creepy? <laughs> You know what I mean? The yeah. secret silent influence of women. Like we're going in and like switching out the polls like, or something. No, she's saying like, no, no, no. Women can't vote, but they can manipulate. Like <laughs> As if that's better. Yeah. Like they can manipulate oh, their gosh. husbands into voting the way they want, but like mm, they can't have their own name on the ballot. I just... Absolutely not. <laughs> it's so funny because I'm sure that like in 20 years, people are going to look back on our logic from today and be like true what the heck you know like it doesn't take that long for your point of view to be outdated but it's just such a strange thing to be like no you can't vote but you have a secret silent influence well and also polls. too to be like women deserve to be educated women are really important in culture and have a responsibility to yeah like, they're the, the moral agents of they're the, the moral country. agents of our country but mm, they can't vote like they can't vote <laughs> Voting's too important. I it's just kind of funny, like Yeah. You know, I whatever. But don't understand, but <laughs> Yeah. But she like I mentioned, she was a really strong advocate of the American nation and union in the eighteen twenties and thirties as other American magazines kind of like compiled and reprinted articles from British literature and magazines. She was among the leaders of a group of American editors who insisted on publishing American writers. Um, and then this is what I mentioned earlier, that quote, in practical terms, this meant that she sometimes personally wrote half of the material published in the ladies <laughs> magazine, which, you know what? I respect that. <laughs> yeah, good for her. I respect it. 
She's like, if no one else is going to do it, don't worry, I'll, I'll do it myself. <laughs> but she also used her pages to campaign, like I said, for a unified American culture and nation. She would run stories in which Southerners and Northerners fought together against the British or in which a Southerner and a Northerner fell in love and married. So she was How very, very, very Romeo and for- Juliet. I know, apparently. She was a big advocate in keeping America together. Now, to talk about our great holiday of Thanksgiving. So, yes. I mean, is she the one reason? Mm, I, I think she might be. I feel like she actually really? might be the reason. So, here's what happened. So, it was, had previously been celebrated mostly in New England, with, you know, mm. like the story behind why there's Thanksgiving, the Mayflower and the pilgrims and all and of that. The fishes and corn and stuff. Yeah, something. there's all the stories. Whatever of we why. got so, told in elementary school. I honestly don't really remember beyond, yeah. you know, dressing up as a pilgrim. I remember having to create a craft project where I planted a fish in some and dirt corn. and then corn grew. I yeah. remember that now, yeah. Anyways. <laughs> That's the story but, I was t- And it was already a holiday, like I said, in New England, but each state scheduled its own holiday for this Thanksgiving type of holiday, some as early as October and others as late in January. And Mm -hmm. in the South of America, this holiday was not really celebrated. It wasn't really known. Her advocacy for the national holiday began in 1846 and lasted 17 years before it was successful. In support of the proposed national holiday, she wrote presidents Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, James Buchanan, and... Abraham Lincoln. Her initial letters, they didn't work, but the letter she wrote to Lincoln convinced him to support legislation establishing a national holiday of Thanksgiving in 1863. And the new national holiday was considered a unifying day after the stress of the Civil War. And before Thanksgiving's edition, I thought this was interesting that the only national holidays that were celebrated in the United States was Washington's birthday and Independence Day. Those were the only national holidays. Everywhere else probably had like their state holidays that were a bigger deal than what the country was doing as a whole. And so she finally got her wish after literally campaigning through all those presidents for 17 years. It was after the Civil War. And I'm sure they were like, yeah, we do need, you know, it'd be nice to have something to say, hey, we are a country. He's like, okay, I helped abolish slavery. I guess we can give everyone a national holiday. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <Okay>. yeah. <laughs> I mean, hey, Hale's efforts earned her the nickname of Mother of Thanksgiving, which I just think is very wholesome. The Smithsonian curator of food history, Paula J. Johnson, claims also that Hale was, quote, key in bringing together and popularizing the Thanksgiving holiday with the menu featuring turkey and stuffing, because in her novel Northwood, which was a tale of New England, she devotes an entire chapter to describing the main dishes of Thanksgiving, which were roasted turkey, gravy, savory stuffing, chicken pie, pumpkin pie, pickles, cakes, and preserves, and to drink ginger beer with that. She made a menu that's lasted until now? (laughs) She's made a menu. Like, Thanksgiving food is because of her novel and because of the holiday that she said, hey, this is a holiday we celebrate in New England. I think the whole country should celebrate it together. And don't worry, everybody. Just read my book. This is what you serve. And we're going to call it Thanksgiving. And that is still what we serve for Thanksgiving at its core. That's a lot of influence. So it's here's so my question. Much influence. Why yes. didn't we learn about her in school? That's what I'm saying. Like, I mean, whatever. Thanksgiving already existed in New England and we learned how that came to be. But like, how yeah. cool is it that it was one woman, one woman who said, this is important to me and I'm going to fight for 17 years because I think Thanksgiving should be celebrated by everybody in this country. Yeah, And now seriously. I have... A whole week off work next week, basically. Nice. Thank you, Sarah Joseph Hale, for my yeah, there you go. five-day weekend, essentially. We should all thank her. And I'm very glad that it's on a Thursday as well. I don't know what the yes. thought process behind that was, because then we all just automatically get Friday off, and I think it's a wonderful thing that should happen more often. Hold on. I'm going to actually Google. Why is Thanksgiving on Thursday? Okay, so from what I'm reading here is that it was so it didn't interfere with church services that were happening on the weekends. This article says oh. in 1789, President George Washington declared Thursday, November 26, 1789, the first nationwide day of public Thanksgiving in the years that followed 
the holiday often changed days of the week. It even sometimes changed to different months of the year. Okay, cool. And then this article talks about how Sarah Joseph Abuel really pushed to make it a national holiday. And then they just decided to set it for the last Thursday in November. Okay, so it was to avoid mixing with church. That's fair because it is kind of a bummer when Christmas is on a Sunday. So true. And I stand by that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, this is a really random thing. that Now I'm like, read this article and I want to read more. So the last Thursday of November was the rule for nearly eight decades, but then in the early 1930s, retailers began to complain that when November's with five Thursday rolled around, they that that didn't leave enough shopping time between Thanksgiving and Christmas. So oh. President Franklin Roosevelt agreed. He thought moving the holiday would be better for the economy, but most people didn't want to change the holiday. So then between 1939 and 1941, different states celebrated Thanksgiving on different days. But then <laughs> December 26th of 1941, Congress passed a bill that made Thanksgiving officially the fourth Thursday in November. And President okay. Roosevelt ended up signing the bill. There we go. Now we know. But then I guess to worry about helping retailers is that the day after Thanksgiving became Black Friday. So yeah, which and that I became don't the, stand by. But yeah, I'm, I'm not a big Black Friday shopper. But anyways, I thought that was just a crazy thing to realize is that Mary had a little lamb and the woman who fought to make Thanksgiving a national holiday, both by the same person. I was just I was so shocked. It's just, it's that incredible. That is so crazy. Plus, mm -hmm. like, the whole telephone thing, like, the most influential yeah. ladies magazine. She had her own, like, Wikipedia, basically, of women. <laughs> what a fascinating woman. What a fascinating woman. So, yeah, she's one of my new favorite, favorite people I think I've covered just because I was, you know, it's one of those things that it's like, how did I not know this? And yeah. That's the fun thing about this podcast and doing this every week is I learn new things that I'm just like, how did I not know this? I feel like I should have known this. Now we do. But anyways, that's all I have on Sarah. So like I said, not as long of other episodes, but it felt so relevant to talk about her now, obviously. I feel like now that we learned that she created the menu, I have to ask like what your least favorite and what your favorite traditional Thanksgiving foods are. Oh man, I'm a big Thanksgiving fan, I will say. I love Thanksgiving food. Honestly, like turkey sometimes is not my favorite just because dry turkey is really sad. Mm -hmm. But when a turkey is done well, that's nice. But I, I mean, I just love mashed potatoes, mm. like the yams with marshmallows and yeah. all that. I mean, that's not traditional. I mean, truthfully, you want to know my favorite thing at Thanksgiving is my mom does like a pretzel jello salad with like a Utah and it's jello salad. I was explaining this to an out of state coworker the other day and I went, Yes, I have had pretzel and pretzels and jello and it's very good. <laughs> it's very good. No, it's same. I was telling people at work that I was like, if I'm being honest, it's it's this. And I pulled up the recipe and they're like, Isn't that just cheesecake? And I was like, mm, the, the, mm. Mm. there's jello it's, in it, first off. Yeah, it's very similar but, to a cheesecake. I'm not gonna lie. Yes, I've had the one you're speaking of. <laughs> Salty pretzel base, cream cheese and whipped it's, cream with strawberries and good. strawberry jello on top. It's yeah. That's honestly what I look the most forward to every Thanksgiving. I so, love it. Makes what me about very you? Happy. It's a very Utah thing. Very Least favorite culture. is definitely turkey. Actually, when you heard yeah. when I heard that turkey was a part of the traditional menu, I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll blame her <laughs> so a little true. bit for that. Um, yeah. I just think ham is better. Ham is so much better. Correct. Yeah. Like, I'm not really a big fan of like a ham sandwich, but I feel like a honey baked ham around the holidays oh, just tastes better than yes. an oven baked turkey. I can't lie. So true. So, yeah. I'm actually like a big fan of pumpkin pie. I don't eat oh. a lot of it. I usually only eat like one or two slices, but it's just like the only time of the year that I enjoy it. That's and true. so it's like, it's such a little staple. Like I'll eat mashed potatoes at other times throughout the year, but like I only so eat true. pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving. Yep. So I I will agree with that. And it always hits yeah. on Thanksgiving, but it always does. I, I never think need it such, again. Yeah. It's just like one of those niche little things that it's like I need to have a slice of pumpkin pie on mm -hmm. Thanksgiving and then I won't think about it ever again ever, until it comes again. around again. No, <laughs> yeah. That's so true. But of course, we have countless jello salads as well. It is a Utah tradition. <laughs> 
We'll always do like deviled eggs as well. Mm. My aunt always makes a very specific cheese ball that's so good. Oh, I'm, nice. Uh, so good. There you go. I guess that's that's it for the episode today. Yeah, that's it. Hope all of you have wonderful plans with your family and you can uphold the Sarah Joseph Hale tradition. And don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or Spotify or Apple, wherever you're listening. Come follow us on Instagram for more content. We're also on TikTok if you're on this. Yes. And I'm really trying to push the TikTok content. Yeah. So come say hi. Always am. And then mm-hmm. just come back next week for more wonderful stories about women and feminism and art history and pop culture and everything in between. Everything in between. <laughs> yeah. We'll be Bye. back. Bye. Bye.